slow-moving prairie river. The entire river you see today has been re-engineered and changed in a fact it's been reversed, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. As we come out from underneath this bridge, uh, look to the right. You can already see a building that looks like it's upside down. How is it standing up? Designed by Getch Partners. I always give credit to architects for the design, but the reason this building is standing up is the engineering. Magnesium and Clement and Associates out of Seattle. They have the challenge of building on 25%. They have the challenge of building on 25% of the building line. So in between the bridges and then here you have the, the, the waterway. And behind you, you see the L going by. But behind these railway tracks that go into Union Station. So it soars up 750 feet into the sky. Look down, you see a massive truss or bridge structure. Bring it down to 45 feet wide, a slender ratio of one to 20. When we come up just a little bit, look back, you'll see the reinforced concrete core. Think of it as a backbone or a spine that's supporting this building. Well, it doesn't end here. If this is marshy soil, you gotta get down to bedrock or power field at 60 to 100 feet below us. So it's all built on casings, think of it as concrete stilts which is supporting that building. All the way at the top, you won't be able to see this, but there's also two liquid, liquid <laughs> I'm not sure why it's doing that, sorry about that. So there's a basically big bathtub filled with water, which due to inertia, when the wind hits the tower at the top, it moves a little slower, so it prevents the building from swaying. Well, this tower here, by the way, in currently is Boeing's world headquarters. They moved here from Seattle. We currently have the world's busiest airport, O'Hare. So Boeing is well at home here in Chicago. But this tower is literally, the base of it is floating or cantilevered above the railway tracks, meaning that it's not, there's no pylons. There's no casings going into the ground. And there's a way they've done that is by supporting the structure. When you look up, you see these five white piers, and you see like a little floating roof. When we come out from underneath the bridge, you'll see how they're literally holding up the entire left or southwest corner of the building. Because it literally floats above the tracks. If you're able to go on the street, you can see where it's just literally hanging. So now that we're right back from underneath the bridge, look up what's on top of the bridge. The sun is hitting it. It looks like a giant bridge. There's a series of five trusses, literally like a hand grabbing that into the building and supporting it uh, from uh, not falling down. Well, this next building on our right, you recognize the style. You saw the merchandise store built around this period. This was 1929. New York Daily News building, Holliburg and Root. They still practice today. They're one of our oldest Chicago firms. And this is one of the first buildings here along the Chicago River with a public plaza, 1929. A wonderful view up at the Sears Tower, which is what it was called when it opened in 1974. Very important building in Chicago and the world because it was the tallest building in the world up until 1999 when in Kuala Lumpur, the took the title. This was designed by a team effort of Bruce Graham working for Skinner Old Barrel and of course working with Dr. Fazlur Khan who is the engineer, sometimes called the Einstein of engineering, originally from Bangladesh, emigrated here, came up with this idea of a bundled tubular construction. Literally, the Sears Tower is constructed of nine separate buildings bundled together for massive compression strength and then as it gets taller, it gets skinnier. And you'll see that in a moment when we come out from underneath this bridge. Look up. Now Sears in 1960s, 1970s was the largest retailer in the entire world. So they wanted to combine an office tower that would also give them the presence in Chicago, but also give them the title World's Tallest Building. So that's why it rises up 1,455 feet. Took the title from the original trade centers in New York City uh, to become the tallest building in the world. Sears stayed in this location to the 1990s, so they moved out to the suburbs, of course. They sold the building, then Willis, an uh, insurance company based out of London, a massive insurance company, bought the naming rights and that's one the Willis Tower since 2009. Look up, what do you guys think of that view? Pretty cool, right? So you see the glass boxes extending out four feet from the facade. They're up 1,350 feet, they're only two inches thick. How many of you guys have been up on the ledge? What did you think of it? When you go up on the ledge, you've not been up yet, next thing, jump up and down in that glass box. I promise you nothing will happen. There's enough PSI pounds per square inch that the yeah. building would fall before the glass boxes would, but you definitely will freak out your people in there. You'll see here clearly that there's a vertical element that goes all the way up the building, and you can see it's divided into three sections here. If you're going to look at the actual floor plan, or actually look at the, the, uh, the way the building is designed, it's nine separate buildings, each 
75 feet by 70. So when David Charles and SOM designed it, he did it first off for the symbolism. He wanted to bring the height up to 1,776 feet to so the date of independence. Now, the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats is based here in Chicago, and they consider themselves an arbiter of tall things. And they said, well, that's part of the original design, so it's a tall structure currently in North America. Sears Tower is number two, or Wills Tower. But in rankings around the world, it's number 20. And I find that amazing. In just 20 years, it went from the world's tallest building, now it's number 20. Now, Chicago is often called the birthplace of the skyscraper because just like in New York, we were tall, building tall buildings. But here, in 1885, we have the first building designed by William LeBaron Jenny as a steel frame skyscraper where the walls were quite, where actually the curtain walls were not part of the structure. So meaning it was very inexpensive to build. It was 1885, right here in the loop, and it's called the Home Life Insurance Building. So here, here on the right hand side, you can tell the, what the building's function is because it's written, written in Roman letters, the Civic Opera Building. Well, this opened the same year as the New York, uh, excuse me, the Daily News Building here on the left. Uh, but this opened one week after the stock market crash of October 1929. Samuel Insel sunk his fortune into the building to bring an opera house here. Look up, you see it's a 40 story office building. This blank wall is actually part of the opera house. You see all the Art Deco motifs, tragedy and comedy mass. Well, Samuel Insel made his fortune with electricity here, uh, bringing the electricity here to Chicago, Thomas Edison. And he's, like I said, lost his fortune, but luckily the Lyric Opera still plays here today. It's the second largest opera house in the United States after the Met in New York City. So on the tour today, we'll see a lot of new construction. This is the only one on the right that's purely an office building. It's here in the business district called The Loop, uh, also designed by Getch Partners. So the same architect of 150 North Riverside on the left, also dealing with a very constrained building space. So how did they deal with it? Well, they first off decided to cantilever the upper floors where the trident comes down, it actually is uh, supporting the roof above and creating a river walk. Now Chicago has blessed with this river walk since 1999. We now require new buildings to be set back from the river to allow us the public access to the river because now we're considering it an amenity, a second lake frontier. Take the nomination of Abraham Lincoln. And he went on to, um, uh, up against Stephen Douglas, the Democratic Party. He won Abraham Lincoln, of course, with Ulysses S. Grant, kept our country together during the Civil War. So there's a plaque commemorating that's where it took place here, next to the Chicago River. So you see the L train going by behind us, that's Lake Street. All the way from this point out, 1.25 miles to, to the uh, Lake Michigan is the uh -oh. river walk. Have you guys been on it? It's a linear park similar to, whoa, similar to the High Line in New York City, but of course inspired by San Antonio's uh, Riverwalk in Texas. For the next six rooms, we uh, between the bridges, there's different themes. They just opened uh, two years ago, designed by Carol Ross Barney. She's based here in Chicago as an architect working with the Boston landscape architecture called Sasaki. Uh, this area is all about art and relaxation. Behind it's a double-decker section of Wacker Drive. Notice the building behind it, the 360 uh, feet long curved glass curtain wall designed by Cohen Pedersen Fox, 333 West Wacker, an example of contextual modernism. Why is the glass? Well, it's also the age of prohibition, meaning in the United States you can't drink legally. Well, people still drink. And one of the inspirations for this, this skyscraper was a champagne bottle. Look off to the right in the distance, you see a giant champagne bottle in the sky. Well, the urban legend goes that the Burnham brothers, the sons of Daniel Burnham, were at a New Year's Eve party drinking champagne, and they said, listen, this will be the shape of our new tower for the carbide and carbon uh, company. So that's 24 karat gold at the top, and of course that green terracotta, terracotta is fire baked earth, but to represent the green glass of a champagne bottle. So that's 1929, we come out from underneath the bridge. You see another tower of the Jazz Age, the Mather Tower, 18-story octagonal tower on top of a 24-story base. Uh, this is all neo-Gothic terracotta. Mather made his fortune with the light, uh, with uh, with the rail cars for moving livestock here, especially to our Union stockyards. And of course, he hired H. H. Riddle to create a very tall building and really maximizing that zoning law that I just told you about, putting that tower on top of his uh, office building. Army Corps of Engineers that say this is the second busiest lock in the entire United States for uh, recreational purposes. So about 12,000 uh, times it opens and closes per year. About 60,000 vessels go through it. Uh, it's second uh, in uh, busy, it's second in um, volume to the Ballard locks in Seattle.
it's really quite small. You'll notice the doors are open. There's 80 feet, 80 feet um, separating them, uh, the two walls. And the wall goes back 600 feet to another lock or door still closed, which is keeping out the waters of Lake Michigan. Think of it as a giant bathtub. And what's going to happen is we're going to enter you. into the lock. Yeah. We will tie up safely along the wall. The doors will eventually close behind us, and the horn will sound. And uh, at that point, the doors on the east side will start to let the waters of Lake Michigan in. If you look at the walls, you'll notice there is a water line. Roughly four to five feet of water, or about 800,000 gallons of water, will come into uh, this lock. Now, the doors will appear to be cracked to see some water flowing in, but they're 22 feet deep, so there's a lot of water pouring in. And just through the force of gravity alone, will be raised up. Yep, he's telling, especially the recreational vehicles, uh, vessels to tie up and to hold on to the, the ropes. They'll also be required if a light preserver's on. We won't need to because of the size of the boat. Uh, the Army Corps of Military is going to be wrapping around the ship in the You guys are going to get a great sunrise there. Uh, sun, uh, sunset. 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 Sunset there. Uh, in a few minutes going down. Now just to the left of the John Hancock uh, analysis, the 875 North Michigan Avenue, is a white rectangular building covered in stone that's called Quarter Tower. Right over sir.